And um, when the sanatory was, um, when they were first um, built in Canada, which is the 1890s, the idea that the was that the treatment of tuberculosis should be, um, you know, fresh air, lots of fresh air, uh, lots of healthy food, um, that they, they should be very comfortable, um, you know, even kind of spa-like um, areas where people could go and relax and, and convalesce. Um, and usually they were located in rural areas, so they would be kind of forests around and hills and trees and birds and um, sometimes there were sanatoria in urban areas as well and those were to, um, to basically be convenient for the families of people who were going to them so they could visit. Um, but Ninette is a really important sanatorium in Manitoba's history. Um, Ninette is a small community right near, well it's, it's uh, south and west of Winnipeg, so on the way to the Saskatchewan border. It's on a lake called Pelican Lake. It's a beautiful area. And, uh, and this is the kind of classic 19th century uh, sanatorium. Very nice, very kind of picturesque and rural. They had 270 beds there, so it's a big sanatorium. Um, and uh, it operated from 1910 to 1972. So First Nations patients could not go there until the so sort of 1950s, when the disease, <coughs> if you remember the chart again, the disease starts to become under control on the non-Aboriginal population and rise in the Aboriginal population. Then, that they to keep the hospital open, they, um, they allowed First Nations pe patients to go. Um, but there were a lot of uh, Métis patients who did go to, yeah, to Ni Ninette, yeah. And just recently, um, there was a, a cairn put up for all the people who died there. So there's, a, there's actually a, a place at the hospital where people can go to kind of remember their relatives who were treated or who died there. So that's the one kind of TB sanatorium in Manitoba. But the second kind, the, the kind of urban kind, is uh, the St. Boniface Sanatorium. Is that right? And it's still there. still there. It's still there. It's called now the St. Amon. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I went there because I was curious. I had a sister that worked there. Right. Oh, is that right? Oh, wow. So this is, um, this is kind, of, kind of an urban um, hospital. However, it's located in the south end of the city. So it's a really pretty area as well, close to the river, the Red River, which goes through Winnipeg. It's a big hospital, 280 beds, and it was, it, it was run by the Grey Nuns um, from 1931 to 1960 as a sanatorium. Um, now in this hospital, uh, they did treat First Nations people. They had a kind of separate wing uh, or ward for First Nations people. So while they were kind of permitted into the hospital, they were segregated as a patient population. Um, but there were, uh, there was another kind of sanatorium in, uh, in Manitoba, and that's a specifically built for First Nations people, an Indian sanatorium. And there were three of them built in, um, in Manitoba, and they were all built between 1940 and 1946, but they were run until the mid-60s. <coughs> so I'll show you pictures of them as well. Um, this is uh, Dinover Indian Hospital. It was run as a sanatorium from 1940 to 58. So again, 1940 is an important era because that's when doctors start to kind of recognize this problem, want to really treat First Nations people. It's a 50-bed hospital, so not as big. It was an Indian hospital before it was a sanatorium. Um, it was run by the, uh, the Anglican missionaries. And um, it's uh, located in Selkirk, and Selkirk is a town just north of, of Winnipeg. So it's a pretty, pretty southern hospital. Um, the people who were treated at Dinover um, came from Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and northwestern Ontario. So they, didn't, they weren't simply uh, First Nations from Manitoba. They came from all over. But because it's a small hospital, um, they didn't have the same kind of facilities as larger hospitals do. Um, so basically what they dealt with was um, people who didn't need to have surgery. Uh, so, they, so there's a specific kind of patient population. 
So that was the first one that opened. Um, again, these are all run by the Manitoba Sanatorium Board. Uh, the second one that opened was uh, in 1945. And this is Clearwater Lake Indian Hospital. And um, as you can maybe tell, get a sense from the way that it's built, it was not built as a hospital. It was built as a military base. <laughs> It's, um, it's a U.S. Army base. This is very common in the post-war period for um, the decommissioned Air Force and Army bases to be picked up by the federal government and used for um, institutions for First Nations people. And so this is, a, this is a very common. Um, but Clearwater Lake Indian Hospital was bought in 1945 and it ran till, um, till 58. It's 160 beds. And it, had, um, it was a full treatment hospital. Um, the paw, it's located in the paw, or just outside of the paw, actually about 20 miles outside of the paw, which is um, kind of midway in Manitoba, so it's considered a northern area. Um, so it ended up being kind of a really a northern uh, focused uh, treatment center. Um, in the mid, uh, early 50s, like 1953, 54, Manitoba started to do surveys in the north, in the central and western Arctic. And so Inuit patients um, started to come down on the, on the ships. And they would be mostly treated here in uh, Clearwater. Um, and this is, this is a hospital. Well, all three hospitals are a real, um, a real contentious part of Manitoba history. Um, First Nations people kind of want to understand a little bit more about how they were run um, and learn more about the history that of, of you know, things that happened there, how patients were treated specifically. So it's really important for the board to open up its records. But the, uh, this is the third one. Again, looks like a military base. It is. Um, it was a decommissioned army, army base. Uh, 1947 to 1959 it was open. It's a big hospital. It's 250 people there. And it's located in Brandon, Manitoba. And Brandon's about two hours west of Winnipeg um, along the Trans-Canada. So it's in the southern area. So that's what the, the sanatoria look like. <coughs> so um, for, for medical treatment, in terms of medical treatment at those sanatoria, um, the ba very basic treatment for patients was bed rest. Um, and then every week or two weeks, they would have a special appointment with a doctor to kind of view their progress. So if you think about it, that's a lot of time um, in bed resting. So um, many of the patients uh, watch TV, they would read. Um, but it was a very lonely, I think, boring time to be in a sanatorium. Uh, First Nations people were in hospital for longer periods of time than uh, non-First Nations people. And that was because of a general belief in the medical profession that, um, that First Nations people would not follow through and take their medication, that they wouldn't um, kind of treat themselves in a way that they would get better. Uh, so some of, the, some of the treatment forms included surgeries. And uh, the surgery, like for tuberculosis at the time, um, surgeries were focused on the lungs. Um, one of the ways that they treated tuberculosis was to collapse the lung. <coughs> and they did that by <coughs> inserting a tube into the ribs. Um, in between where the ribs are and where the lung is. There's a small space. And they would force air into that space to make the lung collapse. And that would rest the lung, the idea was. And then, you know, eventually the lung comes back, right? And then it would be healthier. But if it was still sick, they would have to collapse it again and uh, push air through that hole again. And uh, they're obviously excruciating, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. 
Exactly, that's the pneumothorax. Yeah, that's, that's lucky, I know, I can't imagine how painful yeah, that would be. No, no. Yeah, yeah, pneumothorax. They also had uh, other thoracic surgeries where they would cut out the lung or cut out parts of the lung. It was pretty standard procedure at this time. This is what they did. But, but, but did they know what they were doing? That that would work? The, uh, yeah, well, this was, this was the medical knowledge around the world for treatment of tuberculosis. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But for First Nations people, see, non-First Nations people, if you got a pneumothorax, right, they would, they would <coughs> collapse the lung. You, you know, you would obviously have uh, mobility issues. So you don't have both lungs. Um, but you could kind of go home if, you know, you were no longer um, infectious. But for First Nations people, they wanted to keep people there because they felt if they went home, they wouldn't come back if they needed to get refilled or, you know, for the checkups. So they kept First Nations people in the hospitals for, you know, especially long periods of time. And the same was true for um, when antibiotics came in, especially in the 1940s. Um, Treatments or, or rounds of antibiotics, they didn't trust First Nations people to take their antibiotics without being observed by a medical doctor. So they couldn't kind of take their medication and go home. They had to stay in the hospital until their course ran through. So that, that kind of explains a little bit of why they were there for so long, especially for patients in the north too. Um, there wasn't a lot of um, kind of boats and ships and planes going north, so they would often had to wait until the next supply ship was going up. Um, so that explains why. But a lot of people obviously did not return from being in sanatoriums. So they had a general reputation among First Nations people for places that people go to die. So a lot of First Nations people, um, Inuit people, did not want to go. Uh, but because they're there for so long, and this is, this is really kind of a new area for me to think about medical treatment in a social way. Um, because they were in the hospital so long, um, the doctors and uh, the, the people running the hospital wanted to provide ways of keeping people occupied so they wouldn't get lonely. And so obviously the main forms of... Uh, of um, keeping people occupied were um, in things to do in bed. So they read, um, they listened to the radio, played cards. Um, sometimes they played music. Uh, but also the e at each of these Indian sanatorium, they provided um, education. And um, they did this often in other sanatoriums too, in the main population. But the in the Indian sanatoriums, the, the teachers were um, hired by the Department of Indian Affairs. So it's a federal endeavor. And so the, you know, the, the teaching was really basic. Obviously, they're, they're um, patients, so they uh, were often taught in bed. Um, so they could, you know, basically what they could do, a couple hours a day maybe. But many First Nations people um, accessed education this way, and um, they taught grades up to kind of grade eight, grade nine, grade 10, so up to the higher grades. Um, there was also programs of occupational therapy. Now, occupational therapy in non-First Nations hospitals was pretty, um, uh, pretty diverse. There's a wide range of different kinds of, um, you know, activities that you could partake in. Uh, but at the Indian Sanatorium, it really focused on craft work. 